Hey, this is Dr. Krause with Advanced Python 6 Object Oriented Programming. Um, recording much earlier in the day than usual. My boys are napping, so hopefully there'll be less yawning than uh, a typical video from 11.30 at night. So Object Oriented Programming, or OOP, in Python, I think is really pretty straightforward. Um, other languages, I think, um, kind of have more baggage that goes along with OOP, and so I don't think it's that hard to learn. I think it can do some powerful things to kind of clean up your code, make your code easier to read, make it easier for you to do things. I think it can also make your code easier to reuse. If you can just derive from a class, I think that that does some really powerful things for you. Um, I think we, we saw this with Cherry Pi, but some understanding of object-oriented programming is essential in order to read other people's code and build on their code and that sort of thing. Um, so I think this is worth your time and important stuff. Um, inheritance can be really, really powerful, and that's part of what can make it so easy to reuse code in object-oriented format. Um, I think the hardest part, there, there's two tricky parts in my mind about object-oriented programming in Python. One is getting used to the self uh, that just kind of floats around everywhere and knowing how to read that. And we covered that a little bit in the OOP to understand Cherry Pi. And then the underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore method that is defining how new instances of the class get created or new objects get created. Um, if you get those two things down, I think everything else is relatively straightforward. And it's also important to note that each object creates its own namespace. Um, so my code, as always, is on GitHub. We're still talking about advanced Python. And there is a folder there. So if you went to that page, there's an advanced pi underscore advanced underscore ADV underscore pi underscore six underscore OOP. We'll take you to this file. Let's talk about that. So I decided for my example to create an object that plots a sine wave. And so again, the underscore underscore init underscore underscore defines what happens when we create a new instance of the object. So for example, I come down here and I say sign plotter of 2.0. What that means is that 2.0 is the frequency of my sign plotter. Everything else is taking on the default values. And so in my init method, I simply save the frequency f, the sampling frequency fs, the total time for the plot cap t, and the amplitude amp. And self is always the first input to any function or method they would be called inside the class. So you note that this is all indented. So this is a method of this class. This is a method of the class. This is a method of the class, so on and so forth. So I must pass in an F at a minimum to create a new sign plotter instance. And let's go back down here a minute. This you've seen before, I've talked about it before. It's a strange looking incantation, I will admit. Uh, but whenever we run or import a file, I guess whenever we run a file, there's an underscore underscore main name that is associated with the top level file we're running. So what this allows me to do, I've created this sign plotter class. You could import um, this module into another Python file. And if you just did an, you know, an import sign plotter OOP or whatever, you would have access to this class, some derived classes that we'll talk about later, and any other functions or variables that got defined before this line. So it's a good, like, kind of hard to explain, but a lot of times you don't realize that you're writing some functions that would later be useful in other modules. You can either make sure that all of your kind of helper functions are in their own modules, or whenever you create something like this, you have this line, and so the stuff above it is the stuff you expect to potentially import into other files, and then the stuff below this line is the stuff that only gets executed if you run this file rather than import this file, if that makes sense. So if I'm in another module and I say import sign plotter OOP, then everything above that line will get imported. If I'm in IPython and I say run sign plotter OOP, then all that code will be executed and the stuff below here will also be executed. 
Okay. So I'm creating, so down here, I'm going to create an instance of my plotter called plotter one with a frequency of two. And then I'm going to call the plot method of plotter one. What that means is we go to plot. Um, and so it's receiving as an input is an input self, which would be plotter one in this case, along with these optional values, which I don't give. So they're just uh, going to be their default values. One weird uh, Python trick that I think is really powerful is the function has adder. Basically, an adder is short for attribute. And the question is, does plotter one or self in this case plotter one have an attribute with the variable t as its full name um, if that doesn't exist if, if i look in the plotter one namespace and there's no plotter one dot t then but that lowercase t um, if you look at the init method there's going to be an f an fs a cap t and an amp as soon as plotter one exists but lowercase t may not exist. Well, if I get to the plot method and I've got no attribute called lowercase t, then I call the build tvec method. And so build tvec, again, takes only plotter one, in this case, as its input, or self. And so it calculates a dt that is one over self.fs. Notice that I didn't have to send the fs as an input. It is in the namespace of self or of plotter1. And so plotter1.fs simply is a valid variable. So it finds dt. And then it, since I already have a cap t and now I have a self.dt, then I calculate a t vector using the a range function. And then I save that into the namespace using self.t. Now I could just put self.t right here. I don't know why I decided I wanted to create a little temporary variable, but I did. It is what it is. Um, for variety's sake, when I went to do the calc y, I didn't create, and I don't know if that's more confusing or just trying to show you more options. I don't create a temporary value. I go straight to self.y is equal to self.amp times the sine of two times pi times self.f times self.t. So typical way we would generate a y sine vector, but all of these are, except for sine and pi, are attributes in the name, you know, variables in the namespace of the instance of the class. So this would be plotter1.amp, plotter1.f, plotter1.t. Because we also check, does it have the adder y, and if not, call calc y. Then we can create a figure or, or open a figure in the very usual uh, matplotlib way, given a figure number. If we've specified that we want the plot to clear, which is the default, then we clear the figure using the CLF function. Um, all of that is being imported from here as usual. Um, then I wanted to show you, I just kind of got sick of trying to do this a different way. And so just thought this would be a way to help you understand other people's Python codes. So... Um, in this situation, f is a positional argument because it has no default value. Anything that has a default value is what is called a keyword argument. And so you could put f and then you could just put amp equals three or something and you could skip these two. And because they're keyword arguments, Python knows how to parse those. Uh, well, another way to do that is to create a dictionary and then you can pass in star star and then the name of the dictionary and those get handled just like regular keyword arguments so you often see python users refer to this dictionary as kwargs keyword arguments and so i've created this dictionary i always want my line width to be two if we've passed in a label then i want to create a label keyword argument so if label is not none and not an empty string, then it'll have a positive Boolean value. So kwargs will get a label. And then I, I'd use the plot doing self.t, self.y, the format, which in this case is just a solid line, but could also be you know red dash dash or blue square or green dash for a green solid line, whatever. So format is the third positional argument. And then star star kwargs turns that dictionary into keyword arguments. So if label is not present, this is just line width equals two. If label is present, it's line width equals two, comma, label equals label. 
and then I do my X label and my Y label. So kind of normal plotting. So in and of itself, it's not, it's just something I came up with to kind of illustrate how you might make a, a useful um, object. And I think it does some good things. And we'll talk about, I guess let's do a quick part of the demo. Um, and so for example, plotter one, I, I, I keep saying that a object is a namespace. So plotter one has a cap T value. Plotter one has a DT value. Plotter one has an amp. Plotter one has a Y vector. Plotter one has an F. But all of those are, you know, use the dot and then the name of the attribute. There's not necessarily a cap T defined in my script. It's only plotter1.capt, for example. So all of those variables are encapsulated in the plotter1 namespace. Okay, but where object-oriented really gets powerful, what if I now had this existing thing and I had created sine plotter to solve some problem six months ago, and now I really need a cosine plotter? Well, it turns out that all I need to do is to overwrite the calc y method. So I have a cosine plotter that derives from sine plotter. That means that any method in sine plotter that I don't overwrite will use the exact same code as sine plotter. So it's going to have the exact same init method because I don't overwrite that. It's going to have the exact same build t vect method because I don't overwrite that and that doesn't need to change. It's going to have the exact same plot method and I don't overwrite it because it doesn't need to change. All that needs to happen is when I go to calculate y, I need to use cosine here instead of sine here, and now I have a cosine plotter. Again, is this a trivial example? Obviously. Would you ever really want to use this code? Probably not. But it shows that when I derive a class, all I've got to do is override whatever methods are going to be different. Everything else will be the same. Similarly, what if I, and so I use that here. So let's look at figure one and figure two. Plotter one and plotter two. So for example, if I said plotter one dot calc y double question mark, that actually shows me the code. Whereas plotter two dot calc y double question mark shows me the slightly different code with the cosine. Um, and so if I came over to nope here, and we'll talk about that in a second. But here's figure one and here's figure two. Figure one is a sine wave of two hertz. Figure two has a cosine wave of three hertz and a second cosine wave because plotter four is another cosine, five hertz, and we used figure number two and we did not clear. So it is what it is. Cosine, but, but just to show, this is working for cosine because we see it starting at one. This is working for sine because we see it starting at zero. Now this kind of funky looking wave, which may look familiar if you've done FFT homework, um, is made up of multiple sine waves, uh, two specifically added together, and one is a multiple of the other. So if I wanted to make a double sine plotter, two things had to change. I need to have a second frequency and a second amplitude, so I had to override the init method to give F2 and AMP2 as um, additional inputs. But then in here, I first want to use the initialize method of the base class. And so I call sine plotter dot underscore underscore init with self as a first positional argument, then f, and then I'm passing in keyword values for the other arguments that are typical to the sine plotter. Then when we're done, I'm saving the f2 and amp2 variables to the namespace of the double sine plotter instance. And then when I, so the init method has to change because we need F2 and AMP2 to be saved into the namespace. And then when I go to calculate Y, I calculate the main or first waveform as before, but then I'm going to add to that the second one, which is AMP2 times the sine of 2 times pi times self.F2 times self.T. So F2 and AMP2 are different. But these are the only things I had to change. I still get the build, because we're always going to build the T vector the same way, right? We have a sampling frequency and a capital T. So that doesn't need to change regardless of what we're plotting. And since we're just plotting T versus Y, or T comma Y, we don't need to change the plot method. We just reuse that same method every time. So calc Y or calc Y and init in this case 
are the only things that need to change. And this is the result of figure three. So again, yes, admittedly, it is a kind of trivial example, but I think it shows you everything you need to know about what is an init method, how do I deal with all these little self things, and why is self always the first input to, and what does self mean? We talked about that in the cherry pie. So in the one case, self means plotter one, in the next case, self means plotter two, in the third case, self means plotter three, in the fourth case, self means plotter four. And then inheritance is when I have a new class that derives from another class, and I only have to overwrite the methods that I want to change, and every method that is not overridden is um, still the same as the, the base class. And if I need to call a base class's function, I do it in this way, making sure to explicitly pass in self. Alrighty, thanks.